Well, as we say in Latin, semper gumby, right? Always flexible. It's been a day of that. No, that's not real Latin, I know. It's just... Um, Today's the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany. And uh, our focus really is twofold during that season. The first is the revelation of Christ to the Gentiles, to the world. Because we know that Jesus' mission initially is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But that's just the initial phase. Ultimately, the phase goes back to the promise of Abraham that through you all descendants would be blessed. All the nations of the world would be blessed. And that was the intent, that the entire world would be pulled into this story, into this life. And that's the focus of Epiphany, because Epiphany begins with the three wise men coming from the east, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, recognizing who Jesus was, worshiping him, offering him gifts. And that's the second. The second is the revelation. The second point of epiphany is the revelation and growing understanding of who Jesus is. We've talked about that all through epiphany as we've walked through the early chapters of St. Mark's gospel. How is St. Mark unpacking and showing us who Jesus is? What does it mean that he is the Son of God? What type of authority does he have? What what type of power does he have? This is the one. And that's what Mark is trying to help us see. So in Epiphany, we look both at the revelation of Christ to the world, and we look at our revelation, our understanding of Christ, as we learn more about who he truly is. So Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray, and he takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And Mark 9, 2 says, And after six days he took them up on the mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Transfigured. Not a word we use much in normal, everyday conversation. I don't recall the last time outside of church I used the word transfigured. But it basically means a transformation, and it carries with it a spiritual notion of exaltation. That something has occurred, not only physically, but spiritually. And that's the the notion of the biblical word for transfiguration. We focus a lot in this story on the physical manifestation of Christ's glory. But what the disciples understood as well as that spiritual transformation, physical transformation, is a spiritual one. It's very similar to the story of Moses coming down the mountain and his face had been transfigured by the glory of God, spending time with God on the mountain. And so there's obviously a connection being made here, and it goes on as we walk through this passage of seeing how this connection with the Old Testament and the New Testament come together in Jesus. So transfiguration is not just physical, but spiritual. And Jesus is changed before them, and as he is changed before them, the disciples' understanding of Jesus also changes. It grow, they, they grow in their understanding of who Jesus is. Now, Luke is a little more descriptive about this. Luke shows us that Jesus was in prayer on the mountain when this change happened. Remember, we've, we've said all along, Mark is not very detail-oriented. So Mark said, they go up on the mountain, Jesus is transfigured. It sounds immediate. But Luke tells us, as they go up on the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus spends time in prayer. I think we should note that. The glory of the Lord broke through in prayer as Jesus spent time with his Father. It was during this time, his time of conversing with God, which brought about this change, this revelation. And our Lord always sets the example for us. Throughout his ministry, we see Jesus making prayer a priority. He often sort of goes off by himself and prays. Sometimes the disciples lose him. They forget where he is. And they start looking for him and they find him. And he's been out praying. 
The truth is, if we want to have a transformative spiritual life, we too must make prayer a priority. If we would honestly like the glory, the doxa of God, to shine through us, to transform us personally and as a church, then we too must be a people of prayer, deep prayer, constant prayer, regular prayer. Secondly, we need to note who the disciples see talking with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And again, this is highly significant. Moses, the greatest leader of Israel, the one God used to lead his people from slavery to freedom. Elijah, regarded as the greatest of the prophets in their talking with Jesus. Again, Luke gives us a little more insight, and it makes it clear that they were talking about Jesus' impending departure, the way Jesus would leave his impending death and resurrection. And the actual word used there to talk about Jesus' departure is exodon. And so the gospel writer wants us to understand this connection. In the first exodus Moses led God's people from slavery in Egypt to the freedom of the promised land. In the new exodus, Christ will lead lead God's people from the slavery of sin and death to their promised inheritance with the saints. Jesus is greater. He is the fulfillment of both Elijah and Moses. He is greater than the greatest of the prophets, greater than the greatest leader of Israel. And yet his ministry is tied to theirs as a completion of what they had begun. Jesus leads us out of sin and into our promised inheritance with the saints. Look at what happens next. A cloud came and overshadowed them. Old Testament the cloud was often viewed as the presence of God. So with the two greatest Old Testament personalities standing there, God calls out that they should listen to Jesus. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So imagine you're a disciple there, and you see Jesus. You're, one of, you're either Peter or James or John, and you see Jesus, and you see Moses, and you see Elijah, and you hear the cloud, see the cloud, and you hear the voice. This is my son. Listen to him. There's hardly a better endorsement that you can ever imagine than that. It fulfills, it gives us more insight into the identity of who Jesus is. Jesus is the one that we are called to listen to. Even when standing next to Elijah, even when standing next to Moses, as good and as wonderful and as great as they were, God says, this is my son. Listen to him. Amen. Thank you. (laughs) Do we need this reminder, too? I mean, we are immersed in voices from the time we wake up to the time we sleep. From the television to Facebook to the radio, we are inundated with voices. But are we listening to the voice of God or just voices that presume to speak with God's authority, that want to be taken as seriously as God? I read recently that most church people don't have trouble discerning good and evil What they have trouble discerning is truth. What we have trouble discerning is the difference between God's goodness and that which disguises itself as good. How can we make this distinction? By learning to listen to Jesus and giving priority to his word and his guidance. Learning to listen learning to pray, spending time in prayer. That is the motivation, and this is the reason for the call to the corporate fast that I've laid out for Lent. So you can imagine Peter, James, and John 
thought this was an incredible event. Having been challenged and troubled by some of what Jesus had been teaching, now seeing his glory in the vision of Moses and Elijah, you can understand they would simply like to stay where they are. This is great. The glory of God is present. Moses and Elijah are here. We see Jesus in a new light. So Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And I love the extra line Mark gives. It does give us a detail saying that Peter didn't know what to say, so that's what he said. Typical Peter. I love it. I don't know what to say, so uh, let's just stay up here. This would be great. This is awesome. You can understand the sentiment, though. Sometimes we are keenly aware that something special is happening, that a moment is truly unique. And it's our human nature to want to preserve that moment, to preserve that feeling. Sometimes people have profound experiences of God. They have their own mountaintop moment. And sometimes they have trouble coming off the mountain. They spend their life trying to recreate the mountaintop experience, chasing it. We can do that. A church can have a mountaintop experience. A church can experience success, and without realizing it, they just begin to enjoy the view. Sometimes when we are on the mountaintop, we are reluctant to go back down into the valley. But that's where we're called to be. It's in the valley. We exchange that sometimes, that we are called to be pioneers, and somehow we always want to be settlers. Let me explain. In his book, Lion and Lamb, Brennan Manning suggests there are two visions of life, two kinds of people, settlers and pioneers. And these two types of people display two approaches to faith. And this can be an individual. This can be a church. In settler theology, the church is the courthouse. It's the symbol of law, order, and stability. And most importantly, security. In pioneer theology, the church is the covered wagon. It's always on the move. It's where the pioneers eat, sleep, fight, love, and die. It creaks and strains and bears the scars of life. The pioneers don't mind because that's what makes them love her all the more. In settler theology, God is the mayor. He sits in his office in a big wingback chair with the blinds drawn. Peace and quiet are his chief concerns. In pioneer theology, God is the trail boss. He lives, eats, sleeps, and fights with his people. Without him, the wagon doesn't move. He prods the pioneers forward when they are in doubt or in fear. And Manning walks through several characters in this drama before he comes to this idea. He says, in settler theology, faith is trusting in the safety of the town, obeying the laws, keeping your nose clean, believing the mayor is in the courthouse. In pioneer theology, faith is the spirit of adventure. It is the readiness to move out, to risk everything on the trail. Faith is obedience to the restless voice of the trail boss. I don't know about you, but I'd much prefer to live as a pioneer Christian than as a settler Christian. I believe that is the kind of life to which we are called. Like the disciples, we have to come down off the mountain, roll up our sleeves, reorient our Christian lives around this pioneer approach. Peter, James, and John were given a unique vision of the glory of God. And each week when we come to church, it's as if we too come up on the mountain with our Lord. We are invited to see and experience and participate in the glory of God in word and in sacrament. And we're tempted to want to stay on the mountaintop and miss our Lord's calling to return to the valley to move the wagon forward, to embrace the noisy, messy world with the love and grace of God. That's the adventure that we're called to. So immerse ourselves. Let us immerse ourselves in prayer. Focus on the voice of Jesus and live as pioneers and embrace the adventure of life that he has called us to. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.